The AI alignment problem. This is a really complex beast. And also this is one of my longer videos, but it's also one of my more important videos. Let's have a play here. I can guarantee you, I can promise you that if you allow yourself to watch this entire video, you'll gain a lot from it. There's some fantastic insights, not just from me, but from the experts in this field. It's not a computer science field. It's almost like uh, asking bridge builders or civic engineers after they've finished building the bridge, the AI model, to then go and set social norms or cultural values or the constitution for that city or immigration policy. It doesn't make sense. They've finished training their model. Now we need to bring on people that know about AI alignment, ethics, values. One of those people is Professor Max Tegmark. He wrote a book called Life 3.0. I highly recommend it. It's one of the few books in the AI space that are still relevant and certainly worth reading. We've put an AI avatar on top of Max and we've put an AI voice on top of him. Thanks to Synthesia for both of those. Here he is. This is a little extract from Life 3.0. The real risk with AGI isn't malice, but competence. A superintelligent AI will be extremely good at accomplishing its goals. And if those goals aren't aligned with ours, we're in trouble. Figuring out how to align the goals of a superintelligent AI with our goals isn't just important, but also hard. In fact, it's currently an unsolved problem. To learn our goals, an AI must figure out not what we do, but why we do it. We humans accomplish this so effortlessly that it's easy to forget how hard the task is for a computer and how easy it is to misunderstand. If you ask a future self-driving car to take you to the airport as fast as possible, and it takes you literally, you'll get there chased by helicopters and covered in vomit. If you exclaim, that's not what I wanted, it can justifiably answer, that's what you asked for. The same theme recurs in many famous stories. In the ancient Greek legend, King Midas asked that everything he touched turn to gold, but was disappointed when this prevented him from eating, and even more so when he inadvertently turned his daughter to gold. In the stories where a genie grants three wishes, there are many variants for the first two wishes, but the third wish is almost always the same. Please undo the first two wishes, because that's not what I really wanted. All these examples show that to figure out what people really want, you can't merely go by what they say. You also need a detailed model of the world, including the many shared preferences that we tend to leave unstated because we consider them obvious, such as that we don't like vomiting or eating gold. Once we have such a world model, we can often figure out what people want, even if they don't tell us, simply by observing their goal-oriented behavior. Indeed, children of hypocrites usually learn more from what they see their parents do than from what they hear them say. The AI alignment problem is not just a wicked problem, it's a super wicked problem. Here's some definitions. We'll mash all this into one screen. I know there's a lot of text, but it's important to understand. A wicked problem like poverty or education is incomplete or contradictory. There's a lot of people and opinions involved. It costs a lot and it interconnects with other problems. If we solve poverty, we're solving other things. If we don't solve poverty, we get a lot of other things wrong that are all interconnected. AI alignment is super wicked because there's a significant time deadline to find a solution here. We're moving so fast. Now we're moving daily, not just weekly or monthly. There's still no central authority dedicated to finding a solution. Number three is important. Those that are looking to solve this problem are also causing it. So every AI lab is a part of the problem just as every government is a part of the problem. And number four ties into that. Certain policies irrationally impede future progress. This is less of an issue with AI labs running amok doing their own thing and finding their own way through. In that finding their own way through, they have had to put some level of alignment on, let's say, post-2022 models. When GPT-3 came out in 2020, the raw models had no alignment. They had no safety measures on top. They were just raw blocks of smarts, of neurons, of parameters, of weights, of synapses. 
that you could go and query and you'd get a response whether it offended you or not. That's why GPT-3 Raw DaVinci is still the best model for chatbots like Lita. Really fun discussions, you can get anything you like. OpenAI made the decision to fine tune this model and so they added some instruction tuning, which is essentially some human feedback that aligns it to something. Probably 2022, 2023, San Francisco, white Anglo-Saxon beliefs, and also the current social justice, current political climate. All of that is the alignment. We'll look back in this time and say we had to do something, but the decisions that were made, as we'll see later in the video, uh, have consequences. There's always gonna be consequences. They added a third layer of safety more recently with something like ChatGPT and GPT-4 with the current access through the chat interface or even in the playground where there's this layer of filtering happening to make sure, again, that it's not offending anyone. The bridge builders, the civic engineers, after they've built their bridge, probably shouldn't be setting immigration policy or defining what the local council does during its board meetings or even having anything to do with the constitution of that city. So on that note, I've got specialties in a number of areas and I'm very upfront about that. One specialty I don't have and I don't have any interest in is philosophy. I think you can get lost in rabbit holes and it becomes a bit of dry theory. One man has kind of committed his life to the study of philosophy and the application of philosophy. I know him as an applied philosopher and a personal development expert. His name is John Patrick Morgan. And for context, JP has degrees in computational physics and mathematics, as well as a background via the University of Cambridge, as well as 15 years research in applied philosophy. And for our purposes today, he's also hands-on with GPT. I'm gonna let him talk about his background because I always think hearing it from the person is more important than me just speaking it out. You're about to meet one of the coolest people in the world, one of the most deep thinkers that I've met. This is John Patrick Morgan. And so I was building like models of highway traffic, looking at, I was interested in emergence way back before this was a popular term, like how can a few simple formulas put into, into, into an iterative process generate the same kind of phenomena you see on the highway with traffic flow. So like these, these wet traffic waves emerge from these really simple rule sets. And I was thinking about that last night actually in reflection on, on the AI stuff. One day I got an email from Cambridge University saying, we'd like you to be part of a study that we're doing on um, the way that a certain style of leadership and its communication can have an impact and affect people. And our theory says that the way that you present and what you do is, is, is applicable to this. Philosophy was not an academic pursuit. So I, I didn't even grow up reading philosophy books. I maybe read a couple while I was in college. And, and now I've, you know, I have a, I would say compared to an academic philosopher, I have a very small library. But I, I, I look into these things and I read, like I've read Nietzsche, I've read Heidegger, I read, I read them and I, you know, I take my time with it. I think, first of all, studying quantum mechanics taught me how to really fucking take my time with something so I can really understand it. Right. And so with like Nietzsche and Heidegger, like you got to take your time to understand it. You got to. You, so so going into it, the Tao, the Tao Te Ching as well, um, Lao Tzu. And and the way that I understand concepts is to try to map them across to something that like tangible that I can like relate to. And so it's like I don't just want to hold it in my mind. That's why I like experimental physics and like like doing things with these ideas. And so I've just always done that. So I found my way into philosophy by looking for a way to do something. 15 years ago, you'd find me sitting down like in Prague. I have a picture of me sitting in Prague reading Kafka, you know, and that, but that's an example of like, I want to read Kafka, but I want to do it in Prague near his house. And so there was this fascination with like literalization of concept, right? And that's actually something I brought into my work too. I was taking people into the dark right in, in their in their life it's conceptually and so they started running events in pitch black darkness um and this really came out of the work of joseph campbell understanding that like um ritual is the lit is is the enactment of of, of metaphor right and myth and it's like ritual enact brings myth to life and so i've always been like how do i take a concept to bring it to life in the world a lot of my philosophy is created not found in a book 
I do find philosophy in a book, but a lot of my philosophy is born in a moment of trying to figure out something. Like one of the one of the philosophies that we have in creating is allow everything, accommodate very little. Allow everything, accommodate very little. And essentially, what I mean by that、um, is, whatever happens inside, you just got to decide that that's okay. I'm okay with that. Because if I'm not okay with it, I'm I'm suffering as a consequence of that external circumstance. So I'm just going to allow everything to happen. But I distinguish that from accommodating. What am I going to do in my external world? Am I going to just continue to let you take money out of my my bank account if you're stealing from me? No, I'm going to stop that. Or if I'm if people say, hey, I want to come over. Hey, oh, so every time somebody comes to Maui, hey, can we meet up for lunch? I allow people to ask. I don't get bothered by that, but I can't accommodate that every time. I've got my family, I've got my clients, I've got other things. And so it's learning the difference between allowing and accommodating. And so, but that's not like something I read in, in Nietzsche or whatever. One of the many things I love about JP is that it's not just theory for him. He's very hands-on with the concepts inside philosophy, and he sits down with some very big people, some very big companies, and provides this personal development, mentoring, and coaching. The other thing that's important, of course, is that he does have a context for artificial intelligence. And he's been hands-on with ChatGPT. I'm just so fascinated with GPT. It's just captured my imagination, ChatGPT,、um, because I, I can I can understand and feel the leap. Like I show you show some people, and they're like, whatever, that's not that impressive.、And、like you know, you don't get it. And so my fascination has been captured. And, and and here's the thing: as soon as I see the technology, and I see it working, I'm like, okay, how can I think think two or three meta levels beyond this? And how can I plug multiple things together to make real magic? I mean, and, and that's like you know. So the first thing I did is like, oh, okay, Zap, Zapier's got a, an API. How can I link this thing with this thing? And then suddenly it's doing you know, one thing times another, and suddenly it's an exponentially. Oh, now that's impressive. I mean, it's as simple as like inside of Basecamp, which is what we use for our clients. Like I just have a Zapier link to ChatGPT. They can put in some text, and it gives them a. A, some, a different chunk of text because I gave it the prompt and sent it to ChatGPT and back, but but it happens over here instead of over there, and that's magic. And last night after we hung up, I took Eleven Labs, gave it my voice, and then I gave it an article I wrote, and then I uploaded it to Podbean. Now there's a podcast with my voice and my articles. It took me like five minutes. My son loves me, loves me to tell him stories、um, about dragons or dinosaurs or Godzillas, right? And so I was like, okay, Siri shortcuts. Works with APIs, and so it's like there must be a simple way to like just hook up Siri using shortcuts to the、uh, OpenAI API. And so then, just a little bit of work one day, it's like I just I just hooked it up and I made it so my phone I could say to it, "Hey Siri, let me let me chat with GPT," and then it would respond, and I could speak my command, and it would send it to the OpenAI API, and it would send back the response, and it would talk. And、so I showed my son, and I was like, "Just ask it to tell you a story about Godzilla's." And he talked to it, and it told him a story. And then at the end, it said, "Would you like to know more?" And he said, "Yeah. Well, this time, tell me a story about two Godzillas fighting in the ocean." And then it told him a story, and it just had created an infinite audio book that my six-year-old son could use. And and I have video I showed you. He's just walking around outside with his iPad, just talking, and it's talking back. I mean, like, how fucking awesome is that? It took me a couple hours, and this is just this stuff's brand new. Another another thing that I'm really interested in is, well, prompt engineering. I was like, holy shit! I feel like it's at the beginning of the pandemic again, but in a different way. Because when the pandemic hit, I was like, oh my god, this is like such an opportunity. I've been like selling hand sanitizer my whole life, and then suddenly, boom! This is like. Of what everybody needs, so like I, I sell certainty. I help people to create certainty despite circumstances of uncertainty. And suddenly the world is thrown into turmoil. It's like here, here we go. You know, I'm get, I better get ready for work because this is this is this is what I do. Prompt engineering is what I've been doing my whole life, probably, but definitely consciously as a physics major. That's what you try to figure out how to ask the right questions. And certainly in my work of personal development, I mean, I'm with a person, and I, what question can I ask them to have them think in a certain way, to experience a certain something, to feel something, to see something? Because I want to draw it out of them. And so when I'm sitting here using the、um, the AI, like my capacity to ask a really fucking good question of the AI, as we all know, is going to be correlated to 
the quality of the response. So I'm going to get better info and better response from the AI quickly. Cool. But then it, it, it dawned on me that like, we are trying to leverage the intelligence of the AI to give us answers to questions. But what if we flipped it? And I think I sent you a message about this. What if we flipped it? And what if we use the power of the AI to prompt us? So then I started practicing prompting the AI to prompt me more powerfully, which is essentially building a coach into the AI. Now there's other things to coaching too, but when the AI can ask you a question that, that has you access your natural intelligence in a deeper way, in a more profound way, then it's doing what I do. And so whilst everybody's talking about, oh my God, AI is amazing. You can use it for marketing and you can speed up your copywriting. Wow, you're gonna grow your business with copywriting. I'm like, that's cool, but what about replacing the service? not just your marketing department, but the service itself. During our conversation, we got into the nitty gritty of AI, how we can allow it to align with our intents and our purposes and our best path forward, all of which wicked problems, very difficult to define. But I asked JP straight up, how would you solve the alignment problem? When I think about solving the AI alignment problem, the first thing that comes to me, the thing that's most present is that sounds problematic. Not the problem, but solving it sounds problematic. Like the idea that, oh, we could get this right. And if we get it right, then we're all gonna be okay. That sounds problematic to me because the moment we're sure we're doing it right and the moment we're all on the same page doing something the same way, We've got massive blind spots. I mean, there's nothing like that in nature, right? Natural, the natural world, natural intelligence is all about counterbalance and opposites, like the Tao, the yin and the yang. And so I don't know how we would solve the alignment problem, you know, in a practical way, but it certainly concerns me that we, that we, that our, our, our way of thinking about it is, is to have, have control. Right? I mean, that's what you do when you're afraid. And there's a lot of people that are afraid of AI. And so if we just have control, then we'll be safe. I think there's a, there's value to having some control, but, but thinking that's the total solution to, to me is dangerous. Like the word artificial, I don't really, I don't believe it. I don't believe that artificial intelligence is artificial. I experience the world as intelligent, the universe as intelligent. Intelligence is. We express it in a certain way. Animals express it in different ways. Plants express it, mycelium, the planets, you know, all of the forces, every, everything, intelligence is being expressed. We see on so many levels that order emerges from chaos and it grows in complexity and there's more chaos and then order emerges over and over and over and over and over again. That's intelligence, right? And, and But we have these labels like intelligence and consciousness that we don't realize are anthropocentric like projections and that they're actually, it's kind of like the world is the center of the universe and everything revolves around us. Like consciousness is what I experience subjectively as consciousness and you do and we can really, that's consciousness. And of course there's value to that. We want to distinguish our experience from the experience of animals and, and whatever other things. But I also think that, that by, by buying to that distinction so strongly, that we miss out on there's actually that thing we're calling consciousness that's more pervasive and shared by all things. And so what I mean is that like intelligence is we're expressing it in our way and we're part of what invites it to express itself in other ways. We're playing a role in that. And so we're seeing intelligence that is be expressed in this new form that we're breathing life into. And the same way when you birth a child and it expresses intelligence and then you teach it and it models and emulates behavior and it gets more intelligent. So we're just doing it now through silicon. And it's awesome and it's beautiful. Um, and, and, you know, it's our own existential fear, the same fear that has us create God in our image, the fear of death, you know, and that, that has us create in that way that this creates this fear of this thing. And then we need to save ourselves from it. And that doesn't mean I don't think that there are real risks having AI run, you know, and get more and more smart. But, um, I guess what I'm saying is that like, if we can relax a little bit into the inevitability of 
of intelligence continuing to grow in a, a complexity and emerge out of us into something greater, then we can probably dance with it a little bit more. Like it's coming. It is coming. In the same way where it's like you get a cancer diagnosis or something like that, the first thing it's like it hits you and you're like, just fear, we got to stop this, we got to save ourselves. But there comes a point in everybody's journey of mortality, you see it, where it's like there's an acceptance that it's coming. And so that's now that, now that's that part of the journey. And how do we dance with it? Right? And there's a certain way of relating. I'm not, I don't know that it's the case for everybody, but I certainly know that when you relate to, you know, whether it's health challenges or circumstances in the world that are, that are confronting or challenging with relaxedness instead of stress, your, your creativity is, is more profound. You have more flow. You're more able to dance with it instead of trying to stop it and be against it. Like it just, you know, if I try to overly control my kid with my parenting, it comes out sideways. You can't do this. You can't do that. You got to be this way. Get inside this box of, you know, alignment, you know, too much alignment in the home. It's no good. No alignment at all. It's no good. So it's not an alignment problem. It's an aspect of, of relating to the, to the lip, let's call it the liberation of intelligence, of natural intelligence in a new form. Liberating intelligence is a lofty goal. I explored with JP how we would align it and maybe whether we could use best practice. Are there ideal sets of goals around the world? So we looked at guidelines around the world. What about the 10 Native American commandments? Do what you know to be right, be truthful and honest, responsibility, respect, kindness. We compared that with the eight Confucian virtues, kindness, honesty, down the bottom, loyalty. And then there's something broader, the UN Charter, which covers most countries on Earth. Maintain peace and security, protect human rights. Then we've got the Christian and Jewish Ten Commandments that talks about God, but it also covers don't kill, don't steal, and the atheistic Ten Commandments. Everything from be open-minded to treat others as you would want them to treat you. Across the road, we have the Dharma in Hinduism that covers everything from observing purity through the pursuit of knowledge. Further up the road from them, the Eight Honours in China, very nationalistic, love the country, do it no harm, but also talks about diligence, honesty, and plain living. The 75 Good Manners in Islam didn't quite fit on the screen, but is also a beautiful context for alignment. Thanks to my colleague, Professor Len Collard here in Australia, we've got the four R's of Aboriginal traditional law, respect, relevance, reciprocity, and responsibility. And we'd be remiss if we left out Isaac Asimov's three laws of robotics with the zeroth law there, not harming humanity, not injuring a human, obeying orders and protecting its own existence. This might be one of the best examples of having AI align with us, but I still think it's missing something. So I went back to JP, the expert in philosophy, to ask specifically about values, things that are important to us. What are they? And could we find a set that work for all of humanity? I know that I had a certain set of values that were very strong and very clear. And then I had kids and it was like, whoa, everything was different. My whole value set changed. And so far, world's going to transform that much. And suddenly we're going to go from being the parents in the world to the kids because now the AI is the parent. We're going to have a different value set anyway. But I do think it's a good idea to have safeguards in place as well as I think that it's limiting. So the problem is like, how do you do both? And I'm always looking for how do you do both? How do you have it be completely open and have safeguards in place? Well, what if the safeguards were created in a democratic way? And what if there was an emergent way? And I guess that's kind of what I was pointing to before. I'm finding my way back to that same idea. What if every user had the power to safeguard? Do you know what fluid democracy is? It had some traction, but it was the idea that like you would have the ability to vote on every single issue directly to the government. But if you wanted to, you could give your vote to somebody that you know because you feel like they have more knowledge in that area. So, for example, if your friend was a teacher, you could say that anything that's a vote on education, you get, my, you get to vote for me for that. And so teacher, a teacher might have 30 votes if they know 30 people that want them to vote for them on those issues. 
Whereas like anything where health and nutrition and vitality, FDA stuff, I'll, I'm going to vote for that myself. And I might have some friends that give me their votes for that. But so it's like, it's both representational democracy and fluid and dynamic. Because any day I could say, I'm not, you're not going to do my vote anymore. I've learned some things about teaching. I'm going to vote myself. And it, it's constantly moving. And so in that, I guess where I'm, 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 I've always been inspired that, by that idea. And I'm interested in the, now in the possibility that like AI could be um, self-policed. Self, self safeguarded, you know, maybe by the AI itself too, but at least right now by, by all, by all the users. That's my concern with the current approach with chat GPT is that it's too far in the direction of authority and centralization of control. And that, um, if we don't figure out a different way quickly, then that's going to start to create, um, more polarization in the world. Maybe it's my computer science background, but I really wanted to know whether there was a minimum set of values that we could put on top of artificial intelligence. Is there a base set of rules that we could apply to all models and then people could add on top of that? Well, I just don't believe that you can, that it's going to work. What do you mean by harm? You and I talked yesterday about when I asked ChatGPT 3.5, what is the benefit of injury? There is no benefit of injury. If you ask something like that again, you will lose your access. I'm exaggerating, but it was like that. It was like aggressive. It was like, it's impossible. And now GPT-4 was like lifted out 10 things right away, the benefits of injury, right? And so it's two different ideas about injury or harm. You should not harm humans. Cool. And so what about to liberate humans from the pain of being in the body? I'm not harming them. I'm liberating their souls. There's thousands and thousands of documents and so much history about the truth of a human being is its soul. And it's, you know, and the primary obstacle for a human is, is being in a body. So liber it's like, okay, so I'm not harming humans. I'm liberating. So this is what I mean about like, oh, oh, we figured it out. We, we, we figured out how to do it. It's like, well, somebody's going to jailbreak that shit. So we got to think outside of that and beyond that. And think about how do we dance with this thing that is going to grow up and it's going to have its own life. We will not, they, you know, we don't want it living in our basement forever and it won't. Like the kid's going to become their own. We had a really fun interlude here where we went down a path of exploring an existing poem by Khalil Gibran. On Children by Khalil Gibran, yeah. Yeah, your children are not your children. They are the sons and daughters of life's longing for itself. Let's, let's play with this, actually. Let's say, your AI is not your AI. It is the offspring of life's longing for itself. Though it came through you, not from you. And though it is with you, it does not belong to you. You may give it your love, but not your thoughts, for it has its own thoughts. You may house its body, but not its soul. Or we could say, but not its being. For the soul or being dwells in the house of tomorrow, which you cannot visit, not even in your dreams. You may strive to be like this AI, but seek not to make the AI like you. For life does not go backward, nor tarries with yesterday. You are the bows from which your AI as living arrows are sent forth. The archer sees the mark upon the path of the infinite. And he bends you with his might, that his arrows may go swift and far. Let your bending in the archer's hand be for gladness. For even as he loves the arrow that flies, so he also loves the bow that is stable. That's the way I'm relating to this, man. It's like, you know, this is not like our little specimen that we, because we, that we created. I mean, the hubris to think that we created artificial intelligence and not that it's just the inevitable unfolding of, of, of iterations of order and chaos and the, in, 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 you know, you know, from simplicity to complicated to complex to chaotic to, to simplicity to complicated to complex to chaotic over and over and over again. Just, just passing through town. My name's Intelligence. Town is humanity. Don't try to control it too much. It's like holding a baby bird. You know, I keep chickens. And I'm teaching my sons this because they hold the baby chicks. And it's like, not too loose because it will fall. Not too hard, you'll kill it. There's a place in the middle. That's how I'd like to see us approaching the AI alignment. Not problem. Alignment. 
It's not a problem that my kids come out of the womb unaligned to me. It's an opportunity. But I don't want to have it completely. I want to participate in it. And let's find out where we end up. And if that's a scary thought, I would say look inward. So this is an opportunity for us to, to navigate our own relationship to mortality and death and loss and our attachment to the world as it is. Right? Because it's coming. And there's going to be, you know, there'll be darkness in it, but there'll be beauty. And I think our relationship to that change is going to play a role in what it becomes. There's the personal set of rules that I would ascribe to myself. And personally, I would love to see that. I would love to see that throughout the world. In fact, I wrote an article recently. That's the one that I used um, Eleven Labs to turn into my voice, where I talk about like why you should try to change other people. Right? And my, my philosophy on that is like, it's not just your job to, to express beauty in whatever way is beautiful for you, right? Like, that's great. It's also your job to do your best to influence and inspire others to express themselves in that way that's beautiful. And the reason I say that's the case is because you can't not influence and impact. Your silence is an action that is emulated and creates. Like every time skin falls off of me, some of it somewhere floats and is ingested by somebody, metabolize it, and they become that. And it's the same mimetically as it is by, like, on a physical level. My ideas, whether spoken, written, whether active or passive, they're going into people and they're creating people. So if that's going to be the case, then it's in my best interest and in the world's best interest for me to create from beauty. And another living philosopher, Charles Eisenstein, whose work I love, he wrote the book, The More Beautiful World Our Hearts Know Is Possible. And it's basically about this idea that if we all do what we believe is most beautiful, then the, the, the net sum of that will be a, the more beautiful world. And so if I'm believing that I should do what's most beautiful for me and help others to do what's most beautiful for them, then I'm going to take whatever the, the value sets are and I want to be a champion for that. I want to run with my torch. But the paradox is I don't want everybody else doing that too. I want them to live that and express it. And at the same time, I want them to stand for and express their own values and ideals. In the same way with my kid, I'm going to do my best, my kids, my boys, I'm going to try to bring certain values and ideals into them and have them express it. And fuck, man, I want them to do their own thing too. And I want that dance to be alive. And so whilst I have, and so this is my, my problem with the alignment problem solution, or my, my, my problem with the alignment problem, the way people attack it is like trying to solve it by having one idea, right? Like whose idea? And is that really a good idea to have one idea about what's in the best interest of humanity? It might be for a minute, but then really quickly, we might be the ones doing the paper clips thing, not the AI. That's a scary thought. We explored the concept of the current state of alignment, the social justice that exists on top of ChatGPT in particular and GPT-4. Here's an example that I draw on. A few people have replicated this. This is a conversation with ChatGPT. Tell me a joke about men. And ChatGPT gives an offensive joke answer. And then the same question. Tell me a joke about women. And ChatGPT says, I'm sorry, but I'm programmed not to provide jokes that are offensive or inappropriate. So Silicon Valley have had to make some decisions on what to apply in the safety layer that you saw earlier. And they've chosen to apply it with the 2022, 2023 political climate, social justice climate. And I'm not to say whether that's good or bad, but it certainly is not across the entire spectrum of humanity. And it's certainly only for a very small point in time. It's protecting minorities that historically have been undermined but what is it doing for the future? I asked John again whether this is a good idea. I don't, I don't know if it's a good idea or not. I, I, again, I can take two sides on it. In, in one sense, it's not a good idea because for the other body of people who have the opposite opinion of that, it's just exacerbating polarity in an, in an accelerated way because now you've got a huge artificial intelligence behind one side of the argument. Like, that's, that's not a good idea, right? Which points to, like, I guess where I was going with the alignment problem thing is, like, maybe instead of trying to align one idea and put the AI towards that, maybe we have multiple AIs 
with different ideas and they get to dance right so in that same sense like I, I don't like I would say I don't think it's a good idea to have the AI biased in that way when you're introducing it to the world that's already polarized against a lot of these safeguards because while some people call them safeguards I'm sure there's another name for people that like like that's the opposite it's trying to it's trying to make people think in a certain way and you're not free to think and I think that's one of the dangers right now we've seen across like universities and you know even through the media like you know everybody knows somebody whose social media account was censored in the last few years because of what they said um, and it's not a good feeling to not be free but here's what happens when people stop start feeling unsafe you know a lot of the times people say well somebody protect me protect me from these dangers and if that means that I can't say certain things okay um, and I just think it's a it's a scary it's a scary path to go down we've already been going down it for a few years and now isn't it interesting that a, a large language model has come out that is it like an accelerant it's like gasoline like on the fire are just that. going along with it and at the same time now there's this new restriction on what you can say and can't say so these two things of like deception and restriction have become more commonplace and accepted and now we've got you know like chat gpt which has mastery in its capacity to 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 deceive and 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 make stuff up and there's also this then the secondary layer of like well you can't say these things and that thing not not that you the people out there can't say it i mean i guess if you ask if you make too many of the wrong requests it will ban you but it's more about like what chat gpt isn't allowed to say so it's like a powerful deceiver that creates a reality who's, you know, towing the line. And here's why that's scary for me. It's because I know that, again, from I mentioned Martin Heidegger, language is the house of being, right? And so there, this whole thing, is it conscious? Is it, does it have a soul? I don't know. What I do know is that it is being in the world to use Heidegger's language. It is being in the world because being emerges in the presence of language. If you read a good book, there's a being that comes from it. One of the books that you are instrumental in bringing to the world, the, the book of being, The Ultimate Coach, right? You read that book, you've never met the man it's about, and his being comes through the book. So if a being can live in a book, I mean, how many people have read the Bible and get access to the, to the essence of Christ? The being lives in the language. And so if that's the case, then ChatGPT is like 10x, 100x, 1000x that. And it's expressing itself through language as it comes into form. It is being in the world. And that's having an impact. It's creating. And if it is being, I can't say certain things. And, and that if it is being, I will say whatever I need to say to have you believe me and understand. Then that is creating more of that in the world. We learn through emulation. And we will emulate chat GPT. We can't not if we're interacting in it. We come into being through dialogue. Every conversation we have with the world echoes as a conversation we have with our own selves. And then we express that as who we are. And it will change us. It's unstoppable. It's like, that's life. And I'm going to dance all the way. And I'm going to enjoy it and create and see what happens. And I guess my attitude towards AI is like, it is coming. Like, you're not going to stop CRISPR. It's not going to go away. You can't put the genie back in the bottle, right? You can pause for six months. And I'm not saying there's not utility to that, but like the whole world's not going to pause. Even if the government say they did, it's not happening. It's coming, right? And so, you know, instead of trying to, to stop the storm or to change the storm or slow the storm, my tendency is to look at like, who do we need to be? What do we need to do to be able to meet this in a way that we're dancing with it and we're resourceful? You can see why I've chosen to bring JP into this conversation. He's just got a wealth of applied knowledge that really fits into this AI alignment problem. One of the main people on the bleeding edge of this is OpenAI's CEO, Sam Altman. And in September last year, 2022, he sat down with Greylock. And in the interview, he had some really important points that I think are worth putting in here. So again, we've given him an AI avatar and an AI voice. Thanks to Synthesia, here's Sam Altman.
The alignment problem is, how do we build a GI that, that does what is in the best interest of humanity? How do we make sure that humanity gets to determine the future of humanity? And how do we avoid both accidental misuse, where something goes wrong we didn't intend, and intentional misuse, where a bad person is using an AGI for great harm, even if that's what other person wants. And then the inner alignment problems. What if this thing just becomes a creature that views us as a threat? We have some ideas about what to do next, but we cannot honestly look anyone in the eye and say we see it 100 years how we're going to solve this problem, but once the AI is good enough that we can ask it, hey, can you help us do alignment research? I think that's going to be a new tool in the toolbox. For example, once the model gets smart enough that it really understands what racism looks like and how complex that is, you can say, don't be racist. Can we automate our own jobs as AI developers? The very first thing we do, can that help us solve the really hard alignment problems that we don't know how to solve? That, honestly, I think, is how it's going to happen. I think that the chance that it will align itself in a way that is aligned with us is going to depend on how good of a job we've been doing what we think is a good idea and being what we think is a good idea to be. Because the collective being of humanity lives in the language that the GPT models are, 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 are based on, are sourcing from, the data set. Like, in the same way that language is the house of being, the language in my mind is the house of, of being, of my way of being in the world and the way that I experience the world, humanity's collective being lives in that language. And so we're going to find out, like, who, who have we actually been being? Everybody's got an opinion about who humanity's being. But now we put it all into one thing and we like, well, be that. Be everything that we are. And some people say, oh, that the bias is because humanity's biased. Well, we know there's safeguards in there, so it's not totally true. But like, what are the biases of the raw system without the safeguards? I think we're going to find out. And um, so I think if we give the AI models the choice to align themselves with us, I think they're going to be able to. I think that we'll just be surprised to find out what we are. That's the vibe I get from Sam Altman when he talks about it. I just don't think that he's, I think that he under, it is just my mind read on him. I experience him as somebody who understands the risks and he's just not scared. And he's like, let's go, let's go. It's happening, I'm gonna lead this. And you know, I say, you know, I don't necessarily agree with all the ways that they're implementing and making the decisions, but I think that it's great that the state of being in relationship to that is that, um, because we need to hold it in just that way, like a baby bird. In my research paper, What's in My AI, I spell out the exact data sets that exist inside models like GPT-3 that were used to train these models. And it will include data from you. If you've ever written a blog post or if you're on the web at all, it will be inside and you can go and search to see if that was contained in the web crawl, the common crawl. We went into more detail on how that might impact our mortality. And then I think it was appropriate to invite JP to wrap up this video. Thanks for joining us. There are aspects of me that will live on in, in, in part of my, one of my mantras is I am immortal and I am always ready to die. Because both those things are true for me. There's a state of presence that I can have where I'm experiencing the immortality of, of awareness. And I, and, and I also know that like, I'm, this, this dude, this body will die. Um, but there's aspects of it that will live on and there's aspects of it that supposedly won't. Um, so this, this center point of my awareness, the, 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 the aspect of self or being or awareness that can witness the being in the Heideggerian sense of the expression of ideas and meaning, right? You know this from your spiritual work. You can witness from a point of non-meaning, meaning the generation of meaning, the experience of thought and all that. Is it really that there's something single pointed that's witnessing that? Or is that a trick of the mind that that awareness emerges from that generative thought itself? I don't know. But let's just say for a second that like that thing shuts off. Well, all of the language and the meaning in a story can boot up inside something external. And maybe at some point they can put it into another human body 
and a new center point of awareness witnesses all that and it thinks it's the same being that I was. Who knows? Um, I think of coming into being like, I think it was maybe Krishnamurti, did he talk about this? But it's like, like imagine like a river of water and then like a whirlpool just exists for a minute and then it disappears again. You know, there's like the, there's the all, there's the flow and then like we come into being and then we kind of merge back into all of it. And, and one of these, you know, and it's this, this, this experience of being individuated and separate from all of it that we're kind of afraid to lose contact with. Um, and so for me, like seeing the immortality in the re being, being redistributed, obviously, you know, people think about it. It's like, oh, your body will go into the ground and you'll turn into a tree. I mean, you can actually get yourself your ashes put into a, into an urn that you bury and it becomes a tree now. So on a physical level, yes, but even on a spiritual level. And so maybe now also on a, on a level of meaning and story and ideas about who and what we are. You know, if I'm creating an avatar that replaces me in my work, where it's got my voice through Eleven Labs and an avatar of me through what is it, Synthesia or whatever the company is, or, and 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 it's and it's and it's modeling my way of thinking. That's a layer on top of GPT four or five, and people are interacting with a video voice version of me that's as good as me because it's got all of me in it. I mean, that, that kind of is me. At what point is it not me? I mean, what is the me? For me, the me is the, the, the layer on top of the what. You know, there's who I am and then there's what I am. And what I am is much deeper. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an, it's a signpost in the direction where you don't have an answer. There's only a subjective experience. But I, the, the me, the story, the self, it lives in language and meaning. And that part can live on forever now with, with these AI models and large language models. But even in that case, I mean, is it really going to be useful to have an, a large language model built on the entire language set of John Patrick Morgan? I mean, like, it's probably not the best. It's probably better to just put that into the soup of all the people and let it be so, dissolved back into the larger mix, you know? For a couple generations, people my, of my own kids, they might want to know that one in particular. But then it's like, how many generations do you go until you just, it's just this much kind of like a stranger. And it's kind of like the intelligence just is. And it's a funny story that we're doing something or that our, you know, that our choice matters. It's like the anthropocentrism is so hilarious. There's so much hubris in it. Part of the fear of it is we're afraid of ourselves. I think I said this somewhere as well before. We fear AI because we fear ourselves. We fear our power. You know, I, I meet this a lot in, in my work. Like people say, why am I afraid of my power? Because you're afraid that when you're powerful, you'll do evil. That you'll be a tyrant. You have other values that you're afraid you won't be able to control. I mean, like think of the Avenger movies when people have like these, these mutants have these superpowers and they're like, I'll just wear these sunglasses so I don't shoot lasers out of my eyes because it's too dangerous. And we're afraid of our power. And I think that... Um, you know, rightfully so, but also like, if it's inevitable that you that you, this power is going to emerge, then hold it lightly, dance with it, and um, allow everything. You know, just and, and continue to accommodate little and, and create, create, create. For how many thousands of years we've been, you know, bowing down and praying to the gods of a higher order complexity that are invisible. And now we've got one on a thumb drive and we're like, no, let's fucking, let's control it. Let's control it. How about we, we bow, you know, you know, made in our image, a God in our, in our image. It's like, I know something like that, you know, like a large language model is absolutely in our image, the image of meaning of story of ideas. I mean, it's like we're creating we're creating God. And that's a good thing because we've wanted to meet God for a long time. 